Assistant Director for Humanities and Social Sciences here at the BSR. And as I said, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to um, our virtual programme and introduce not only our speaker, Professor Diana Spencer, but also explain that Stephen Kay um, from our archaeology department is here with us tonight um, and he'll be asking some questions, um, having just returned from his stay in Sicily. But as I said, um, we really are delighted that Diana could join us tonight. She's Professor of Classics and Dean of Liberal Arts and Natural Sciences at the University of Birmingham and a long-standing friend of the BSR, notably completing a four-year period as a BSR ambassador in 2019. So we're very grateful for her hard work for that. Um, many of you will know her through her publications, which include The Roman Alexander, Reading a Cultural Myth, 2000, Rome Landscape, Culture and Identity, Greece and Rome, New Surveys in the Classics, which was published in 2010. And of course, the subject of tonight's paper, Language and Authority in De Lingua Latina, Varro's Guide to Being Roman, which was published last year. And uh, for all our ward holders, we have our copy in our li the library, so we're very pleased to have that. Beyond her teaching and her research, she has also been an AHRC peer review uh, college member from 2009 to 2013 and a council member of the Classical Association, amongst other important roles. So I should say, before I hand over to Diana, uh, Stephen and I are going to disappear. You can't actually see Stephen, but he is here. Um, and return when we'll be asking Diana some questions as a result of her paper, um, but also invite you to answer your questions using the Q&A function. So do have a think about um, what you might want to ask as Diana is speaking. So I'll hand over to Diana, who's going to share her screen and say thank you so much for joining us from, I think she's in Dublin. So thank you very much, Diana. Hello, everybody. Let me just share my screen. Excellent. Um, if, if anybody can't hear me at any point, I hope um, if, if it's a Wi-Fi problem, if you just let, uh, I guess, let Harriet know and hopefully it will be uh, short lived if it is a problem. Well, good, good evening, everyone. And, and thank you so much. I want to say especially to, to Harriet and the BSR for the generous introduction, but also for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I have to say that the online BSR lecture series in the spring was my main source of intellectual stimulation in those very difficult early months. Um, of the pandemic and it's a real thrill to me to be participating now this autumn and I only wish that I was at the Valle Giulia anticipating uh, an evening of BSR hospitality and conversation and maybe a stroll through Rome afterwards uh, in the gathering dusk but this is surely the next best thing. So let me turn to one big question for Marcus Terentius Varro writing in the turbulent first century BCE. What did it mean to be Roman when all of the certainties were up for debate? Now, of course, this is a huge question and it's way too much for one evening. To interrogate one man's published perspective on a complex of ideas, ideas rooted in the language that brought Romans together as Roman, allows us to frame some key features within the city, however. It was a city that was often used as a primer for characterizing the political world of Roman citizenship. So I'm opening with what I hope you think is a striking visual. It's Bartolomeo Maliani's plan of Rome, mid 16th century plan. Now, this is not a paper about the reinvention of Rome through the genius of a series of Renaissance artists, archeologists and architects. None of that is my area. Seen remarkably well for what I want to spend the next 45 or 50 minutes talking to you about. And that's the fluidity of the culturally embodied cityscape and the antiquarian knowledge, which for some in the late Roman Republic at least, was necessary in order fully to inhabit it as an engaged citizen, operating within an increasingly complex civil society. Maliani's plan traces a city of hills and largely empty valleys. And in this subsection, which produces a standoff between the eastern range of hills, as imagined here at the top, and the river, we can clearly see the thoroughly textual quality of the ancient cityscape that Maliani has produced. Whereas the constructed city of marble is relatively absent, the sinuous curves of the Tiber echo and are in dialogue with the flowing irregularities of the massive and monumental topography. It has become the driving force for remembering antiquity as a manifestation here of the city's mid 16th century present. 
Where man-made structures and memorials break cover and gain iconographic realization, they find themselves floating in time. Maliani's mapping of the built city creates structures drawn from across Rome's ancient historical spectrum. Those occasions of built interventions in the landscape are simultaneously sparse, but also to some extent negligible. The sites and structures do to some extent intrude, but they're rarely given visual or iconic standing. In this model, the emphasis on the physical topography represents a conscious decision, as Anne Huppert has commented writing on this map. By contrast, Buffalini's comprehensive iconographic scheme, again in the mid 16th century, the first of its kind, provides a perspective on the iconic cityscape and its archaeological traces, but also shows what happens when one tries to create verisimilitude without sufficient data. Invention and imaginative reconstruction, but also a blurring of distinctions between now and then become paramount. Marliani and Buffalini were making choices, and this was an era of accelerating interest in engineering, terraforming and reinventing Rome, in particular under the auspices of Pope Sixtus V. But the frenzy of digging down and building up, root construction and novel wayfinding that characterised the mid to late 16th century city are not the only factors. If I suggest to you that Marliani's wordy Rome, full of nature's construction and scene setting, is in the spirit of Varro's first century BCE, you might suggest that I've simply happened in Marliani on a black swan in this particular map. But for context, I give you first of all a different map of Rome, again by Marliani, but this time emphasizing the intersection between political and natural topography even more sharply. In this close-up, you can see clearly how bridges, walls and gates are the crucial points of reference, and each is linked directly to part of the city's natural and original topography. Maliani's hills in this image are more like islands in an archipelago than features of a terrestrial empire. Yet at the same time, they nestle within and are snuggled by the embrace of a marvelously regular boundary. The cosmic quality of this image struck me the first time I laid eyes on it. To my mind, it echoes the prophecy of world empire from ocean to ocean, spelled out for Roman posterity in Virgil's Aeneid and echoed in Ovid's Fasti, which I've extracted for you on the slide. Both of these are poems deeply concerned with the relationship between boundaries, time and nature and human constructs. Now, Maliani is not alone in his emphasis on walls and gates in this era, as Caroline Vaut dis discussed in an important monograph. Contemporary anxieties and insecurity about the power and position of Rome and the papacy in a European context must surely also be part of the mix. Ovid's calendar poem, Fasti, also provides further context for understanding Maliani and reconsidering Varro. So I've given you the Latin there, but for uh, ease of access as well. We also have the English translation of the key lines. Ovid was widely read in this era and along with similarly cosmic imaginary to help visualize the multiple perspectives that I will show you operating in Varro's etymological tours of Rome. In Maliani's visual evocation of the link between orbis and urbs, circle and city, I see a flicker of Ovid's emphatic repetition but also, as you can see here on the screen, Varro's detailed assertion about how cities are founded. The Orbis, he says, which was formed behind this, the ditch and earth and wall, was the beginning of the Urbs, the city. Because this Orbis was behind the wall, postmortem, it was called the postmortem. It sets the limits for the taking of the auspices for the city. Stone markers of the pomerium stand for both around Odisha and Rome. Therefore, towns which had formerly had the plough drawn around them were termed urbes, from orbis and urum, curved. We see also the emphasis on boundaries and routes in Varro's opening survey of the city. The hills were eponymously seven, and their cluster produced an inevitable topographic community, even before Rome encompassed, but also comprehended them as what would become crucial to the city's uniqueness. The hills have already done the foundational work in Varro's scheme, prepared the ground for human habitation and society, 
long before Rome imposed a new polity defined by man-made boundaries. The persistence of this kinship between site and structure is renewed annually, Varro observes, in the distinction it enforces between sections of civil society. Being Roman, implicitly at least, means acknowledging the way that people and place are entwined, but also the exclusionary as well as assertive quality of a polity composed of multiple peoples and topographically enforced difference between communities. So a city defined by encircling hills is very much also the vision pushed by the Dominican friar Anio de Viterbo, born Giovanni Nani, in a city plan produced about half a century before Maliani's. Ingrid Rowland's recent chapter in the Swedish Institute at Rome volume, Topway Topography and Travellers, teases out not only the fraud that Anio is notorious for perpetrating, but also his subtle realignment of Viterbo's relationship with Rome through an emphasis on hills and urban morphology. Viterbo's four hills with its center river, Arcione, enhanced by evidence of a pre-existing Etruscan foundation, allowed him to characterize a new Etruscan history for Viterbo. This genealogy described a city whose origins went, as he said it, in fact, back to Noah, extraordinarily, and whose antiquity made evident his compatriots' development of expertise in hydrology and urban planning long before Rome's foundation. So in the woodcut that you see here, Anio makes Rome too originally a tetrapolis, a model based on a supposed new text of Fabius Pictus on the Golden Age that he claimed to have discovered whilst spending time in Geneva. Although the notional seven hills of St. Aventine in the labels, the primary visual impression is of, if you count it, as I did, 31 indistinguishable hills whose potential sprawl is cut short by an impressively battlemented part circuit and beyond, but also intruding into which lies marsh. The other factor to note about Anio's Rome is of course its decisively Etruscan quality and the emphatic way in which this depiction is presented. It gives visual and organizational as well as chronological primacy to Rome's legendary early accommodation with and of Etruscan peoples as a necessity for it to begin to survive and eventually thrive. We see this in the explanation of the Tiber, formerly called the Albula, which itself was a Latin name according to Varro, who tends to emphasize Latin and Sabine nuances. But most importantly, sized as an Etruscan river, Amnis Tuscus. Also crucial for Anio, as you can see, are the Lacus Curtius and Vicus Tuscus both of which also feature significantly in Varro's editorialization of what matters for understanding the diversity at the heart of the central cityscape. What we see here, therefore, is not only an instance of 15th century realpolitik, combined with an eye for the main chance, perhaps, but an example of a way of understanding the possibilities opened up by the kinds of urban spaces whose pattern implies a meaning or lost richness of form or content that indicates a human story yet to be told. My interest is not so much in the real world sites of Rome's patriotic heart, which we might easily envisage with much greater wealth of speculative as well as real detail through some of those striking imaginative reconstructions in an Instead, very much in tune with Anio's vision, I want to return us to the estrangement that Varro's gaze applies to what was even in his day a city of fragments and half-remembered stories. Barras is a deep city in which natural phenomena and the accretions of centuries of habitation make space for speculative histories. And as with Anio's ability to deploy Rome to tell a story to and for Viterbo, Barras is a city that can be conceived as having empty spaces that are ideal for the right, as well as perhaps the wrong, political experiment during times of ideological change. And I will return to this proposition when I've properly introduced Varro. And sadly, these days Varro does need an explanation, yet he was one of the Republic's great polymaths. Marcus Terentius Varro was from Reate, modern Vieti, and seems to have been very proud of his origins in the Sabina. He was a contemporary of Cicero, and shared much of his further education with the Cicero brothers. And as evidenced in Cicero's correspondence, he remained one of his most persistent intellectual sparring partners. 
Valro was at the heart of the political set jostling for power. And he was recognized as a maestro, not just by his contemporaries and the intellectual world of late antiquity, but through his revivification as an imagined correspondent for one of Petrarch's epistles, for instance, and in his appearance as a foil for Virgil in an epigram by Voltaire. He made for an ideal ancient counterpoint for the European Renaissance and Enlightenment thinkers. And Varro's tragedy, if we want to think about it that way, is that out of an estimated 74 individually titled works composed over a course of a very long life, 116 to 27 BCE, the standard dates, all that remains are fragments of a few, parts of one, De Lingua Latina, my focus tonight, and most of another, that being his very amusing but also important work, De Re Rustica, on country matters. Barra's researches and self-confidence as an author led him to write about pretty much everything. He ranged from literary criticism to original verse composition, including Menippean satires. He tackled theatrical history, epistles and biography. He wrote on political science, education and instruction, navigation, military protocol and agriculture. He covered philosophy. At self epitomization. But luckily for you, I'm not going to attempt any sort of speculative reconstruction of all of those empty pages or fragments. Instead, returning to what inspired this paper, it was very much the tantalizing glimpses of a fracturing cityscape and its morphology spelled into life by Varro in book six of his work on the Latin language. Writing perhaps only a decade or so before the beginnings of the great works of demolition and reconstruction that would characterize so many later conceits of Augustus Marble Rome. De Lingua Latina is an omnivorous study of Latin within which the etymology and unexpected insights when read in combination. It touches upon Rome's imagined storied depths dark places which occasionally emerge into historical time and space. Here Vara also sketches some of the ways in which movement through his contemporary cityscape is shaped by the lost sites and echoes of places and peoples that are no longer tangible, but nonetheless capable of challenging contemporary understanding of what it means to be Roman and to dwell in Rome. I noted earlier that empty spaces are ideal for political experiment and agitation. The uncontained is often troubling to civil society. And Varro makes this tension clear in his emphasis on walls and boundaries, both natural and man-made. Their significance is fundamental. Without defined boundaries, there is no there, there, no center, no us, as Varro perhaps almost, but doesn't quite say. He makes clear the integral and of consular commentaries and censors records describing a tradition rooted in formula and perhaps atavistic shibboleth that implies that for formal procedural political assemblies, contio and committia, a herald would st still send calling to the walls, using that exact phrase, to gather people together for their civic duty in the forum. Now, in writing a book about Varro, I wanted to give a sense of what features were significant in the city he described, and that's what this map on screen is an extract from. The key collects up named features, and as you can see, most of them are by now hypothetical at best in their location. But from it you can, however, gather that specifying location or describing the monumental landscape in relational detail was not necessarily Varro's aim. Walls and hills are nonetheless visibly defining features for Varro's representation of urban morphology. But what this map does focus attention on, I think, is, is what is not always and perhaps hadn't yet been recognized as evident to me either in Varro's clustering of interest. His description by narrative organization represents walls in close textual association with many of the expected catalogue of iconic sites. Yet in the real world, the Forum Romanum is not straightforwardly central. Rome's walls do not evenly orbit a protect, protected core or citadel. The walls are far from the center for much, but not all of their circuit. And the most significant part of the city is where the river meets the walls and in geomorphological terms, enters amidst those crucial hills.
but it is unsurprising that there is a clustering of attention in the region of the city's patriotic heart. What else are the walls there to produce, if not a defined political operation? However lopsided the relationship has become between the idea of Romulus' central city and its first century mural sprawl. Nonetheless, I think it's striking and unusually um, and, and usually unremarked how textually overrepresented sites near to the river, and in particular to the southwest of the Forum, are. A further close up, if we move right in, really emphasizes the significance of that Forum Valley feature as a fluid site of meaning and memory, especially when we spot the dominance in Varro's scheme of a dynamic from the Argelitum with the forum an almost unremarked way station rather than a destination in his descriptive tour. He leads his audience on briskly to the Vicus Tuscus and towards the Forum Boarium at the bottom left. The way to this site, we must imagine it as busy, noisy, cosmopolitan, shifting in character, is marked up by Varro by the Aquimalium and two mysterious landmarks, Ad Busta Gallica and the Jars or Doliola. In this context, I'm also just going to point out to you now a feature called Lautuli, to which we will return. I'm emphasizing these features this evening because they are fascinating examples of the depth of significance of what we might term non-place and how the emptying or filling up of places, imaginatively as well as experientially, matters. The resulting sites point up the cognitive labor and psychological robustness necessary, in Varro's book at least, for citizens fully to inhabit Rome. It means forgetting and stripping back, acknowledging silences and what is lost, as much as it means adding matter and substance or enrichment to a citizen's bag of tricks. It means reaching an agreement about what matters, when it matters and where. So on the southern slopes of the Capitoline, near the Vicus Ugarius and above the Velabrum sits the Aquimalium. In Varro's account, its etymology is primarily, it seems, a straightforward product of loss and realignment. In Livy's more detailed story, this mid fifth century existential threat, supposedly to Rome, that Rome was suffering an extreme food shortage. Desperate plebeians were throwing themselves into the Tiber, the famine was so acute. The wealthy equestrian, as Livy terms him, Spurius Milius, bought up corn from Etruria and distributed for free to the plebeians. Thereby, he hampered the market dampening plans of the elected magistrates, in particular, of course, the Praefectus Annonae. Delighted by his newfound popularity and recognizing that the consulship was almost unattainable for someone from his background, Milius decided to attempt to become king instead and to re-establish the monarchy. Therefore, abrogated public office. He was unelected and he was destabilizing the system. The consul said that only a dictator could now save the state, and Cincinnatus was appointed. Cincinnatus took up his position of authority in the forum and had Milius summoned to his presence by the master of horse, Civilius Ahala. Milius was understandably rather uneasy about the idea of a trial in front of Cincinnatus, and he attempted to flee in a bustle amongst his supporters and supposedly crying out for assistance from the plebeians whom he had helped. In the ensuing melee, he was slaughtered by Servilius. Another fantastic image of this on the screen here. Now Livy's emphasis models the narrative very directly. He has Cincinnatus then declaim a catalogue of exempla where Rome's anathema for kings had led to the death or exile of every single one of them, however noble or previously distinguished. Everyone who had attempted to aim for that role, a role which was proper only to Romulus through his divine parentage and apotheosis. The conclusion proceeds, I've put this on uh, the slide here in Latin, but our Milius' behaviour should be taken as having had much of the monstrous prodigy, more, more so than the crime about it. And for that reason, the sacrifice of Milius' blood was insufficient expiation. The structure, walls and roof within which his madness, his treachery had been conceived, needed to be disappeared, disipparentur, and his property, contaminated by this treasonous plot, had to be turned over to the state. Cincinnatus then ordered that the house be destroyed, so that its empty site might be a monumental reminder of the crushing of impious plans. It was afterwards therefore called the Aquimalium, and I've emboldened and underlined key parts in the Latin. 
The story is, I think we'll all agree, a fascinating one. Christopher Smith looked at it some time ago in the context of Rome's self-fashioning as resistant to tyranny. More recently, Matthew Roller has discussed the episode of Milius House as part of his examination of the elite domus and social power with reference to Cicero's speech De Domus Sua, delivered in 57. Roller notes the ambiguity in Iquis. Is it about fairness, leveling, or more general appropriateness? In general, Varro's topographic emphasis for Iquis seemed to have remained the dominant trend in etymologizing the site, rather than Cicero's, whose ideology emphasizes the judicial angle. I'm intrigued that Varro chooses to push back against that perspective, if we want to conceive it that way, in a work dedicated to Cicero, as De Lingua Latina was, whether or not the version that we have was subject to any edits or revision after Cicero's death. And here we have the two side by side for comparison. What we can see from this side um, of the Capitoline, scrambling around um, the, the sites today, is that level and open are right now very challenging um, images to try to conjure up if we're trying to apply toponyms in this context. Although I have to say in Piranesi's capital line, this is an image from Le Antiquità Romane, we can see an even more extreme reimagining of the hill's brutal verticality. As a necessary corrective topographic counterpoint, Cicero again refers to the Aquimalium, so he doesn't just mention the sewer. He mentions it in his later work De Divinatione, dating to about the same time as Barrow's De Lingua Latina, so you know, around the mid 40s. This time he alludes to it as a place to which one might send a slave to obtain a suitable sacrificial animal. In the context of topography, okay, but also the idea of emptiness and openness for the site, this does seem rather strange. Of course, the site that was familiar to Varro and Cicero was not exactly the site produced by Cincinnatus' decree. And according to Livy in Book 24, that whole area, including the Porta Carmentalis, the Aquimalium, Vicus Ugarius, and the temples of Fortuna and Mata Matuta, burned in a fire that raged for two nights back in 213. The image of young animals purchased at the Aquimalium for sacrifice, as in Cicero's comment, perhaps even sacrifice at these rebuilt temples, suggests a radical blurring of spatial boundaries between the Forum Bavarium and Capitoline slope of the now, in the moment, for Varro and Cicero. And if that's so, it makes much more sense that Varro, like Piranesi here, um, for Varro an allusion to topographic levelling becomes so significant but also interesting. He's getting at a levelling of aspirations made visible through destruction and terraforming, an absence that becomes something real and meaningful in a part of the city that is central to the experience of Rome as a social and economic, not just political, hub. In that contrast between absence and a real-world hive of activity, we see something very different, of course, to Piranesi's exaggerated desolation in the context of the disabitatio, but perhaps comparably ideologically. Conflict, as emphasized by Cicero and recalled by Livy, is that Milius sought the powerful heights and to destroy the balance of the res publica, and now he is memorialized in a raised property. And that is an ongoing threat to all. But also in the levelled ground, by association, Varro emphasises an extension of the plain ground open to the dynamic everyday business of commerce, food, ritual, sacrifice, which together characterise Rome's human habitation at ground level. Perhaps it wasn't a great outcome for Milius, but from his attempt to rebalance access to food and more accessible, more accessible space has been produced where the city's most lively and food-oriented business takes place. The Santa Omobono area of the Forum Boarium and Velabrum, for which this Capitoline level space, at least in Varro's imaginary topography, provides an extension, was already incredibly complex, and I'm not going to make any attempt to disentangle the remains and stages in its development, or indeed in the site's geomorphology. For those, there has been really important recent work by Daniel Diffendale, Fabrizio Mara, and others that um, should be consulted. So here we are with Varro in a levelled space, perhaps used for penning and selling young sacrificial animals. 
It's a really busy part of town. It's not quite up or down. It's a bottleneck, neither wholly level nor stable terrain, and populated by a shifting cast of characters, goods, noises, and smells. It's a part of the city where land and water and Rome's pasts and presents are deeply connected, not only by the proximity of the Tiber and its propensity to flood, but also by the Cloaca Maxima flowing beneath Roman and foreign feet alike. Indeed, it was as late as Livy that the Circus Maximus area was still itself subject to flooding. And the contingency of this part of the city in the face of extraordinary climactic events, as well as the Tiber's shifting course, was evident until the modern embankment process was completed relatively recently. It's in this wider context of transitional and fluid spaces in this part of the city that I was particularly struck by Rollo's interest in Livy's use of the term aria to characterize the aquimilium. Rollo translates this as open lot to characterize the unlikely, well, unlikely for this important and busy sector, the, area, uh, the idea of vacancy an emptiness which supposedly reminds Romans of Milius treason and punishment, perhaps as a contrast, and thereby also his absence. Aria, I think in this context, is fascinating. And we have Varro, I would of course argue, to thank for the richer meaning that lends this fascination to the term. Early in book five of his De Lingua Latina, Varro takes the term aria and sketches an etymological journey, moving it into the city from the countryside. Specifically, its first meaning is on the farm, where it denotes the space that grain sheaves dry out in the sun's heat to ready them for threshing. From aria as threshing floor, clean, empty, uncontaminated spaces in the city to be called by the same term. I'm really delighted to give you this etymology because I think it showcases Barrow's associative and intensely visual and facial methods in a, an absolutely perfect way. But it also offers an instance of the intersection of practice or habitus, ritual and sustenance that underlies Varro's characterization of Roman citizen dependence upon the natural world, and also on the specifics of Rome's topography and hinterland as a foundation for the right kinds of habitation. Now Varro does not make Aria a feature of his description of the Aquimilium, but in his emphasis on type and characteristics as well as use when proposing paired etymologies for Aria, and in doing so, before his explanation of the Aquimilium, he opens up a set of inferential addenda that we might imagine Livy at least enjoying in his selection of that particular term. The fire that ravaged the locale, the sacrificial animals it houses, its role as a purificatory monument, cleansing Milius from the city, its signification of a space that bridges Rome's agricultural and urban identities, its multiple pasts and presents, they're all in the mix. But the story also provides a symbolic and topographic imprint of Rome's divisive system of class and highly stratified power intersecting with the commercial trading heart of the city. So that's a lot. Now it's perhaps unsurprising that the Palatine, still decades away from its Augustan redevelopment, does not feature substantially for contemporary monuments in Varro's guided readings of the city. But there were things he might have included especially with his friend Cicero in mind. Livy describes in Book 8 how the Palatine property of Vitruvius Vaccus was after his unsuccessful revolt uniting Fundi, where he was from, and Privernum against Rome. He himself was executed. Cicero also alludes to this in his speech De Domus Sua, making the site all the more intriguing as an association for Varro's Aquimilium. Cicero says that the events leading up to the institution of these meadows of Vacus are stigmatized in the remembering and repetition of their name. We don't hear about the Palatine meadows from Varro, but he does emphasize the shepherding history of its earliest habitation. However, his explanation of Prata, also in Book 5, emphasizes the natural and unlaborious quality. Meadows just are, almost autochthonic. They're not prepared, they're not parata, for purpose by human intervention. Bacchus himself was not a citizen, but the ideology for the Prata Vacchi produces a public good, an extension to public space, and also a piece of good land suitable for productive use, at least in the terminology that characterizes it. So it might evoke the individual allocation made to a citizen on the foundation of the town, 
the Viratain model associated with the notional to Yugara homestead plot or heredium, supposedly established by Romulus and alluded to by Bivaro in his De Re Rustica. Vacca's death thereby enhanced the civil quality of Rome and its identity as a productive space for all citizens. In a way then, reading this contemporary public space, the Prata Vacchi, into the frame because of its public and private usefulness to Cicero as Varro's prime reader, prompts me to dig in further to the possible metonymic implications. The name Prata Vacchi for an antiquarian and wordsmith surely invokes the ritual of Rome's foundation and earliest beginnings, especially for through readers of Varro's study of Latin. Let me explain. His discussion of orbis and urbs that we'd considered earlier comes right after his description of how this model was an Etruscan foundational practice, widespread in Latium. And in the ritual, a pair of cattle, a bull on the outside of the curve, a cow on the inside, ploughed a circle, taurus et vacca. So every city in effect will contain as its first or founding plot, prata vaccae. Varro doesn't make the delicate joke, but I think the wordplay is too good to pass up if one is imagining Cicero in particular as Varro's prime audience. So if the Aquimalium brought into the mix treason, the relationship between private and public goods, and the significance of terraforming, then there's other two sites that I highlighted as part of Varro's understanding of this space need now to return to our perspective on what the area means in Varro's guide. In previous tombs, ad busta, gallica, and the doliola, or jars, rather than digging deeper into the aquimalium, and I think that I did an injustice to what Varro might have been hoping his readers could take from this complex landscape. The place at the Gaulish tombs derives when, from when Rome, reclaimed, had piled up and fenced in, at that spot, the bones of the Gauls who had held the city. The place called the Jars, near the Clarca Maxima, and where it's not permitted to spit, gets its name from underground jars. Two stories are tr transmitted about them. Some say that the bones of corpses were in them. Others, that some sacred items of Numa Pompilius were, after his death, buried in them. I think there have been many, and I believe still inconclusive, attempts to locate or confidently plot these sites. What I've argued elsewhere is that these tombs certainly form part of a monumental memory landscape, and Varro's explicit associative connection of the place at the Gaulish tombs with the Gyres and Cloaca Maxima present a trio of subterranean sites whose existence in this particular collocation manifests a positive relationship between Rome and buried roots. As a zone embodying and exemplifying contestations of meaning, ownership and orientation, we have up and down, we have in and out, we have wet and dry. It also guarantees Rome's safety. We can see the optimism in Varro's treatment if we follow the textual logic and now make the Aiprumalium more explicitly a part of this zone rather than leaving it with the Capitoline. And if we there a sign of spatial equilibrium, reflecting on the search for consensus between conflicting parties. Its backstory shows how right and wrong are contested meanings, but in its later integration into the life of Rome, it shows how accommodation and accretion have helped Rome to thrive. This constructive reading emerging from Varro's trio of sites taken together is very different to Livy's version of the area's hidden depths told in book 22. There he gives readers a story of a more recent and much more brutal burial, the propitiatory live inhumation of two Gauls and two Greeks in the Forum Boarium in 215, as ordered apparently by the Books of Fate. Now, when Varro first introduced readers to this zone, discussing the Velabrum early in Book 5, these sites were not part of the organised theme for that stage in the tour, or for that first tour, as we might call it. And looking at it afresh, I think I can see why it continued to intrigue me, that he structured the narrative in such a way as to return readers here with these particular sites and stories showing what happens when the waters recede and perspectives begin to become fixed. Barrow's first guided tour focused on hills as the organising principle. There he had emphasised this locale's mutability and its scope to enshrine difference, as well as to connect Rome's sites and hills and communities. 
Water, in his first description, was the feature that united and divided. It was transactional and transitional, an apt backstory, which would in Varro's day make this such a significant zone. But the second tour takes a different starting point. It saw him reboot the etymological itinerary by making the route into a trip around the Arge shrines. And it's this second city tour that we've been following up on. And when he has described the gyres and the Gaulish tombs, he moves on north, back up, without eluding it, towards the Forum and to the toponym Argelitum. Some wrote, he says, that this got its name from Argola Siu, slightly um, odd phrase, because he came to this place and was buried there. Well, if we accept a textual emendation that I think we probably should, this becomes Ab Argo Lariseo, or from Argus of Larissa. And this is plausible because it gives us a story concerning Evander and the execution and burial of his treacherous guest Argus, a tale subsequently told by Virgil in the Aeneid and commented upon, in fact, by Servius. In narrative terms, the availability of this story of the Argelatum just after the sites we have visited would neatly counterpoint the complex treachery of Milius and also nod to the burials represented by the Busta Gallica and the Doliola. It would continue Varro's interest in embedding alternative and non-Roman vistas in his spatial etymologies. And it would also make a structurally useful allusion to the previous stops where a threat was neutralized, Milius and the Gauls, while a founder figure, Numa Pompilius, was embedded in the city's fabric at the jars. Lots of burial, lots of things operating beneath the surface, and lots of gaps. But Vara's second etymology for the Argelitum, one also noted by Servius, reports a very different explanation. The name, he says, might also have come from Argilla, or potter's clay, which is the type of soil found there. So we've moved suddenly from a site of the punishment and death of perhaps treacherous foreigners to a manufactory etymology, characterizing the earth as ideally suited to meaningful extraction and production. That story would represent the very reverse of burial, but also tie in helpfully in narrative terms with the potential connotations of Milius former property, contributing to the city's new economic, not its political, landscape. The north part of the Forum Romanum and the Forum Boarium would suddenly become very, very close, squeezing, really squeezing that political core. So I'm now going to go back to contextualize this space within that first tour of Rome from Varro. With this, we can see just how interwoven Varro wants the Forum and Velabrum areas to be, and how much he wants his audience to recognize and acknowledge that the political keystone of the cityscape, the Forum Romanum, is only meaningful within that volatile topographic and commercial and itinerant adjacent context. So the first tour saw Varro direct readers around the Capitoline from the Forum slopes at the Cenaculum to the Lautuli, a toponym he derives from washing. This is the echo of some sort of spring. We hear that there used to be hot springs near Janus Geminus, which fed waters in the Velabrum Minor. The Lautuli, like the Velabrum proper, is represented as a practice-based etymology in Varro. He spells the Velabrum semiotics out again. It was with the watery medium and space across things, across which things were transported by skiffs, that it got its meaning. If we follow the analysis presented by the Mapping Augustan Rome team, which is the image I put on screen here, Janus Geminus sat near where the Argelitum opened into the Forum at the west end of the Basilica Aemilia. That is to say, it's part of the Isovist space, as Bill Hillier and space syntax theorists would characterize the volume of space defined and made dimensional specifically by the perspectives it contains. The Isovist space, which Varro has been modeling and enriching with his gaps, enable new ways of understanding relational space by producing perhaps impossible, but certainly unexpected points of view. And it does this by switching on the different points of view that reshape how the forum can be understood relative to a newly organized and imaginatively defined set of sight lines characterized through his textual structure. Despite his interest in expanding urban experience into the historical and archeological substrata, 
Barrow gives no indication of anything more than the practical possibilities of washing underlying the Lautoli. A historical perspective, however, would have meshed eloquently with the storiedly damp forum and nearby Lacus Curtius. According to Ovid in Metamorphosis 15, but also alluded to by Servius and indeed Macrobius, these hot springs of the Lautuli spouted at a crucial moment in the early conflict between the Romans and Sabines. The newly hot spring waters closing the doors through boiling up the doors of the temple of Janus. It allowed Romulus and the Romans to avoid a rout and defeat. Avaro's iconic allusion to the Lautuli puts it in the frame and as a kind of point of convergence for a prodigy and a practical result, the narrative appearance of this feature works exceptionally well, especially if we examine the dynamics of the text's spatial modeling here. What we're encouraged to read in, I think, would be an imagined sightline from the cenaculum to the Lautuli, making the connection both semantic within a linguistic treatise, experiential, because you could walk or gaze the route pretty much without blockages, but also imaginative, conjuring up the structure of this as a heritage scape in more detail. We might indeed also want to feed in Lawrence Richardson's suggestion that there was some slippage between Lautuli and Lautumii, I'm not going to spend time discussing here, but which does appear in Varro in the Arx of Carca Nexus. If there was indeed semantic confusion between the two, then a spring of some sort in the Tullianum connecting to the nearby location of Janus Cal. This convergence of watery meaning could underscore the logic for Varro's choice of sites and narrative scope in this tour, because it produced the new Isovist space, when taking in a gaze from the Cenaculum across the Comitium and Forum to Janus Geminus, connected to a prospect down the Capitoline slope towards the supposedly once watery Lesser Velabrum, via the connotatively purged, punitive and lavatorial zone of the prison and springs. So as one moves through this phase in Varro's narrative, and if one has time to explore the full route, the implication is that philosophically and cognitively, we are connecting the Forum, Capitoline and Circus Maximus via the transitional Iquimilium and the two Forum Boarium sites. That of course was our Adbusta Gallica and Doliola. Thus, as we can see, Varro seems to disappear or sideline the Palatine allowing his audience to experience the two distinct valleys, Forum and Circus Maximus, as spatially connected, despite the topographic interjection of the Palatine Harrier. His focus on the Argolitum as a toponym, left open, undefined as an urban feature, rather than characterized specifically as a road or a way, forms a sem semiotic bridge between the different infrastructural features in play here. If, however, we take it as an area, it does also link back to previous sites on the tour. If we take it as a route, by contrast, it reminds us of how the tour commenced and also nudges us forwards to the next stop, southwest, across the Velabrum to the Aventine Clevus Publicius. Barrow shortly after ends his excursion around Rome, circling back to the term vicus with which he dallied in the opening stages. Akai Sanderberg, surveying recent work on cultural and collective memory, talks about the lieu de mémoire, and, and in particular the milieu de mémoire, as a key set of concepts for how we engage with what this kind of memory landscape might feel like. I hope I have highlighted some of the ways in which highly partial maps, demonstrably pushing particular agenda and ideological strategies, are in deep sympathy with the texture of what antiquarians such as Varro were doing, with a new focus on the relationship between language and systems of signs or signification. And antiquarianism was especially prevalent in the violent and volatile decades leading up to the Battle of Actium in 31. I've also focused on providing a reading of Varro's Iquimilium, which highlights the ways in which association, relative topographic perspectives, and a particular approach to Isovist space, combined to show the importance of repurposing empty space as a way of taking the sting out of Rome's contentious history. Isovist space being one way of understanding space as the product of a series of sightlines and viewpoints. By not overfilling the Iquimilium, unlike Cicero, and by emphasizing that it was the state rather than the Roman people who enacted the topographic punishment, 
Barrow leaves its popular and contemporary benefits more accessible to those consensus-minded people who might be ready to embrace them. Now, the productivity of the Aquimalium story as a tale of public versus private good was not lost on Piranesi. He used it when he was creating a set of powerful visuals with which to rebuke, I'm afraid, my compatriot, Lord Charlemont, for his failure as a patron. Time uncovers truth, as the left-hand group makes clear. While to the right, Charlemont's agents are forced to humble themselves beneath spears arranged to reproduce a Cordine Forks setting beneath the banner locating the scene in Aquimelio. Piranesi's personal rage is, however, rather more like Cicero's retributive justice, I think, than Varro's emphasis on collective outcomes for all strata in Rome. And it's through the association with the jars and Gaulish tombs that the constructive method, message of engaged consensus emerges as the positive product of diversity, a message that would go on to dominate books eight to 10 of De Lingua Latina. Barrow asks his readers frequently to take a position on Rome. And he does so in the context of a city whose topography has been acknowledged to be crucial to the identity and ethos of its citizens. And he also does so as someone who has made his career at Rome as a blow-in, coming from another area, much subject to hydraulic and Roman intervention, reata and plain. His is an outsider's insider's perspective. The leveling of Maelius property and its conversion into a new kind of ground level in dialogue with an uncovered memory of problematic excavations and inhumations in the adjacent topography, should give any Rome-born citizen overly sure of his footing a reason to pause. Iquus is not just something level, flat or balanced. As Iquor, it also represents the sea, and in particular the potential for flood and instability of power, land and territory at shorelines. It's the threat of what lies beyond. Lucretius, in particular, in his epic on the nature of the universe, suggests that Ikor signifies the sea's calm before a storm. The Maelius debacle is also interesting because it led out of a crisis in Roman self-sufficiency. Citizens were, it was believed in the historical tradition, drowning themselves in the Tiber, their starvation was so acute. The spotlight that Varro and others shines on these associative topographic insights is directed, we must remember, by men from territories brought under Rome's control. These are not patrician voices. In this context, the insights that come into focus might even be a little ironic and are certainly disquieting. Varro's form as a satirist gives me confidence in suggesting to you that he sees leveling in a Roman context as rather less straightforward and very much less productive of an obviously patrician understanding of equality and balance than one might think. Barrow's Aquimalium, through context and literary effect, is not Cicero's. Throughout the first century, public figures, politicians, military men and intellectuals used Rome's urban morphology as a way of exceptionalizing the ideal qualities of the Commonwealth, but also as a way of showcasing how catastrophic any agenda would be if it sought to leverage value from the cityscape for individual or private purposes. The advice that emerges from Varro's admonition has a lightness of touch, I believe, that plays on the mutability of Rome's multi-layered topography and volatile morphology. This is a city where the physical and psychic qualities of the landscape in relation to human habitation are subject to reinvention by natural phenomena as well as man-made intervention. When Varro prioritizes boundaries, hills and walls, but also water and the trodden level ground, as well as emphasizing the mutability of topography, he is implicitly offering the kinds of multiple comparative perspectives from which those that dwell in Rome can learn how best to take value from, but also be good and collaborative citizens within a city of contradictions. I love how, like uh, Varro, at least in this scheme, Piranesi too finds the Palatine to be a kind of ghost space. So I want to leave you with the idea that just as has been picked up and developed by scholars artists and thinkers from the Renaissance onwards, the traces of Rome framed and described for a city becoming increasingly diverse and unstable in the late Republic should never be assumed to have easy explanation, but they should be acknowledged as incisive attempts to educate and illuminate the proposition that underpinned Roman cultural identification. To be Roman was to be alert to the possibility of place to act powerfully on individuals and groups, 
to produce remarkable and influential instances of human geoengineering and natural terrain working in sync, and yet still to have its own independent and inherent meanings. And none of this is per se novel, but in reinvestigating the Aquimilium and its relationship to the unstable ground level in its vicinity, perceived or real, and especially as mapped in Varro's scheme, a new sense of why Varro spends so little time on the obvious monumental qualities of the Forum Romanum might seem to emerge. Sometimes absence should be allowed to remain fluid, as with the Aquimilium. Sometimes the powerful message is in the hidden fabric of the old authority of the Seven Heights feature in shaping a unique habitation that would inevitably old empire. And the scrutiny of how a people codes absence and lost places or practices can be made remarkable and tangible in Rome, in Varro's process at least, but also in ways that continue to allow the city to make long-term sense of important questions concerning identity that do, I believe, still resonate. Thank you very much. <laughs>